Hi everyone, I'm Richard and a little while back I reviewed the Core i5-7600K. Now innovation may be lacking but then again so is competition making it almost by default the fastest mainstream gaming CPU money can buy. Which begs the question, is the costlier i7-7700K that much faster? Does it warrant its much larger price tag? And is it that much of an upgrade over older Intel CPUs? But before we tackle these issues, let's quickly recap on the new features of the KB Lake platform. Well, the biggest disappointment here is that the core itself is essentially identical to last year's Skylake. The 7700K has a 300 megahertz frequency boost over the 6700K, but both run identically clock for clock. And that's what we're doing here at 4.5 gigahertz. Identical results there in gameplay. So if you own a Skylake system, I can see no reason to upgrade whatsoever. But there are some extra goodies here. First of all, there's a new media block featuring full hardware support for HEVC and VP9 next-gen video codecs. Secondly, the new 14 nanometer plus fabrication process allows for higher overclocking. And I'll have more on that in a bit. There's also the ability to run faster DDR4 on non-overclocking boards, and this can help performance on locked versions of KB Lake processors. But going into my testing, I really wanted to get to the bottom of what an i7 actually offers compared to an i5. Yes, you get extra frequency, but it's child's play to overclock an i5 to i7 speeds, but you also get hyper-threading and more onboard cache. So how much extra performance does that actually offer? Well, this is Ashes of the Singularity's punishing CPU-focused benchmark, where we are running both i7 and i5 processors at 4.8 gigahertz with identical 3000 megahertz DDR4. We get an average 44.1 FPS on the i7, 33.1 FPS on the i5. So that's an additional 33% of performance clock for clock and we can actually surpass that ever so slightly here with Crisis 3. Even at 4.8 gigahertz on the i5, you'll find areas of this game that will run below 60 frames per second. In fact, even the latest KB Lake i5 gets monstered, not just by the 7700K, but even a lower clocked 3770K with 2400 megahertz DDR3. And the i7's dominance isn't exactly a scenario that's limited to those two games. Here's a quick wander through Rise of the Tomb Raider's tax geothermal valley. Clock for clock, once again the i7 is 34% faster. I mean I could go on, let's take a look at our Witcher 3 test run here. The gap isn't quite as wide but we're still seeing a 26% performance advantage to the i7. The 7700K is actually handing in an astonishing 145 FPS average versus around 115 FPS on the i5. So by my reckoning, the argument that there's no meaningful performance differential between an i5 and a similarly clocked i7 is clearly false. It's just that the i5 is already very fast to the point where GPU limitations make the i7's advantage difficult to measure. So yeah, the bottom line is that performance limits are generally defined by the GPU, not the CPU. And here we've used an overclocked Titan an X Pascal at 1080p to remove that limit and this brings CPU power to the fore. But it should be stressed that even with this insane misuse of Titan X power we can still hit GPU limits and in this scenario i5 and i7 performance levels out. And The Division is a good case in point here. This game actually utilizes many more than the eight threads of the i7 if the process resources are there. But in this demanding benchmark, there's barely any difference between a stock i5 and an overclocked i7, despite a vast gulf in their core capabilities. And let's be clear here, we're engineering scenarios here to push CPU capabilities to the forefront, but in most real life gaming situations, clearly it's the GPU that's the limit. By going for an i7, you're effectively reversing the focus of our test here. You're throwing so much power at the CPU side that you're doing everything you can to ensure that the GPU is your limit. And to be clear, that's generally the way I prefer to game. And you can help to ensure best performance from your processor by pairing the i7 with appropriate memory. If you watched my i5-7600K review, you'd have seen compelling evidence that CPU performance scales with memory bandwidth in gaming. And it's the same with the i7. 
I'll show you the most dramatic example here, the Witcher 3 with the stock i7 compared to the same benchmark run with a 4.8 gigahertz overclocked. But this is paired with slower DDR4 memory. Yeah, we've pushed the processor to its limits. Power efficiency has gone out the window. The heat being generated is tremendous. But remarkably, the stock CPU configuration is handing in faster performance. Let's factor in three memory speeds with a 7700K and you can actually see the scaling we get. Overclocking helps of course, but it's got to be combined with faster memory to see the full benefit. We get a 20% uplift to performance here simply by using faster memory, whether you're running your i7 at stock or with an overclock in place. And while we're covering this, we should discuss KB Lake's improvements to memory bandwidth on lower end boards, not just the high end Z170 and Z270 enthusiast products. Compared to Skylake, CPU frequencies are increased in KB Lake, but memory support increases in step two. So let's take a look at Rise of the Tomb Raider again with the last gen 6700K at stock frequencies paired with bargain basement 2133 MHz DDR4. And we're gonna compare that with the stock 7700K with 2400 MHz DDR4. Okay, so it's not a vast revelatory improvement, but it's certainly useful. Extra clocks and extra bandwidth are creating the gap between those two lines there. And let's keep those comparisons going. How does the 7700K stack up against older generation i7s? Well, here's the fascinating thing. What I've done here is to run four i7s at 4.5 gigahertz and to repeat my tests. Ivy Bridge and Haswell i7s are running paired with fast 2400 megahertz DDR3, but up against Skylake and KB Lake, there's no competition. Access to more memory bandwidth and two generations of IPC improvements are the key here. And to be clear, both of those old chips are still pretty great gaming performers overall to the point where if you are considering an upgrade from say a 20 2500K or a 3570K, well, going for the 3770K i7 with a memory upgrade is very much a viable option. However, with Skylake and Kaby Lake, we have now moved on to a new performance tier, and I'm actually tempted to try out some of the stupendously fast colossally expensive DDR4 just to see what the theoretical limits of today's i7s actually are. Okay, so in that vein, let's talk overclocking. We'll be seeing a fair amount of five gigahertz overclocks with KB Lake, but I have to say, I had access to two i7s during my testing and neither of them would budge over 4.8 under load and the heat they generated was tremendous. Now, release BIOSes for KB Lake boards do have an interesting option. Mainboard manufacturers have determined that a key source of excess heat comes from running AVX instructions at higher clocks. So the new BIOSes are offering the ability to offset those, allowing those to run at a lower clock while the main processor is still running at a much higher clock. Yeah, it's an interesting idea and I'll be fascinated to see how people get on with it, but it didn't do much for me. 4.8 with or without the offset was the best I could do on both of the i7s I tested. But the question is really whether you need to overclock this processor at all. Fit your motherboard with fast RAM. Make sure XMP is enabled in the BIOS and quickly check that enhanced turbo is engaged. And you have a completely hassle-free 4.5 gigahertz on all threads with full AVX. Yes, we can push to 4.8 gigahertz and perhaps beyond, but the payoff is minimal. Most of the time, you'll see no difference whatsoever in gaming. And in our benchmarks, the best I could actually see was about an extra 3.5% uplift in both lowest and average frame rates. That's a whole lot of not much, bearing in mind the extra heat, voltage, and cooling required to push that i7 to the limit. So it's actually quite ironic that KB Lake offers enhanced overclocking because there's actually a pretty good argument that with this i7 7700K, it's just not really needed. All of which begs the question, where do we go from here? Architectural improvements provide only minimal gains generally. We've clearly hit a frequency wall. And some might say that we already have tons of performance to spare. Just how much more power do we actually need in the here and now? Well, that's a discussion for another time. What we have here is a phenomenally good gaming CPU and a daunting target for AMD to match with its upcoming line of Ryzen processors. Now we'll be looking at those when the time is right. But in the meantime, thanks for your time. Do like, subscribe and share our work if you enjoy what we do. 
And remember that you can access a high quality download library of everything we do if you support our Patreon. But that's all for me for now. Thanks for watching.